Okay. I think we should continue here in the interest of time. And uh, yeah, welcome back from the break. So this check your understanding question here, if you have had a chance to go through it, that's great. If not, we'll just quickly do that here because uh, as I just mentioned, we do need to kind of keep moving in order to have time to see the second part of today's lesson, which is quite relevant for the final exercise in the course. So let's start, let's just copy what we have above because we're going to make a plot that's somewhat similar to what we had above and I'll just paste this then, then here. And we were asked in this case to um, plot temperature data from the 6 p.m. until midnight on October 1st. So we'll change our date here to start at 1800 instead of 1200 to go until midnight on October 2nd. So start of the day of October 2nd or end of the day on October 1st. And instead of a cold time, we're going to have a warm time because we're asked to identify, for instance here, the uh, warmest temperature in the evening. Now, normally the way that you would do this is you would make the plot and then take a look and see what is the warmest temperature or come up with a clever way to figure out what's the maximum temperature for, uh, for this date. But in this case, we're going to say that we already know it and that it's at uh, 2120 on the evening of October 1st, 2019. So we were asked to do a black dotted line connecting the observations, so do not show the data points. So as mentioned, the intuitive K is the letter for black, and data points we can show with a dotted line, at, or I mean, sorry, the line as a dotted line with the colon uh, symbol. And then for our title, we could say, for instance, uh, evening temperatures. Um, at Helsinki Vanta Airport, whatever. It doesn't matter what you put there for the table, or for the title, rather. But we want to have our start time and end time, as we've already defined before. We don't have to do anything there, but we can set our temperature range here to go from maybe 35 to 44, because we have a different time of day, we have a different range of temperatures, and we have a warm time instead of a cold time, and the warm temperature in this case is 43, which we'll label this way as warmest time of the evening. And I'll put the arrow over on this side with the way that the plot works here because it happens to be warm late in the day. You can find the example on the course page if you're having any difficulty with this, but essentially you should make a plot in the end that looks like this. And I'm sorry to kind of move through it quickly, but again, if you're curious about this, uh, you can find on the course page in the little drop down uh, where you can see the solution to this, check your understanding problem, and you'll see uh, how to do things like add the label for the time at the right time of day and convert the plot format and things like that as we've seen. Any questions about that? Yeah. So the main changes, just as, as to review, are updating the times. So to go from 6 p.m. to midnight, and please note that midnight on the uh, 2nd of October should be used to indicate the end of the day on the October 1st. And then we had set the warm time to be at 9.20 p.m. That sets the left side of where the plot text is going to be displayed. So that's why this looks a little bit weird. Um, so if you look here, the warmest time of the evening is actually close to midnight, or sorry, close to 11 p.m. But we say put the text at 9.20 because that just happens to be, like for the string of text we're showing here, the place that will allow the string of text to be written and the arrow to be positioned so that it points at that warmest time of evening. So the reference point for when you put the, this uh, warm time, it will be on the x-axis, the left side of where the text starts from. 
and otherwise then we just made a couple of modifications like here changing the format of the line and then updating the y-axis limits and then changing this to be warm time instead of cold time yeah yeah i mean it's a good question so we could essentially take uh, a section of our data frame and see what's the warmest temperature for the range of dates like we could use this dot loc function to say okay between you know 8 6 p.m and midnight and then find what's the max value for the temperature column there so that you could find at least the uh, what the maximum number for the temperature is finding the time at which that maximum temperature occurs could be a little bit um, a little bit more challenging but uh, there would be ways that you could also do that. I think once you know what the maximum temperature value is itself, you could say, you know, figure out which uh, rows reach that temperature and then see what the index is for that row if it reaches that temperature. It's a little bit, um, if you wanted to automate this, I'd say it's worthwhile to figure out how to do it. Otherwise, oftentimes with this kind of exercise of making a simple plot, Sometimes the fastest thing to do is just to make the plot, look at it, and then add the text afterwards. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's show a couple other things here. Uh, next one up here is to uh, make a bar plot in pandas. So um, we've shown how to make line plots. This is an example you can just run uh, there's some kind of slightly more complex things about adding the text labels to the plot uh, for a bar plot. I'm just going to show this because it's it's not so often that you make uh, these kind of bar plots in pandas, but if you want to, you can do the same representation of the data. Here you can see that's from 12 o'clock until uh, 3 p.m. So this is the afternoon of uh, the 1st of October in 2019, and here are the coldest temperatures labeled now on the bar plot with a slightly different format. Um, probably if we wanted to get more sophisticated, we could even find a nice way to put an arrow in here, but we just use the V to point down to say this column has the coldest temperature for that, that day. The key thing to note here is that we've added this parameter kind equals bar as the way to change it from a line plot to a bar plot. So just by adding kind equals bar, that will tell pandas to plot with a bar plot instead. That's the main thing um, about making the bar plots here. And that's the kind of only thing I really want to point out. Otherwise, you're able just to run the cell. There's nothing to type in, uh, to type in here. And it makes a nice looking bar plot like this. So two other things here before I turn things over to, uh, to Kamyar. So one is that, um, common thing to do is to save our plots once you've produced them. And in order to save the plots, we can use something here called the save fig um, method in matplotlib. So in order to use that, we have to import matplotlib. And the common way to do this is to import matplotlib.pyplot. So it's the Python plotting part of matplotlib as a PLT. This is the same bar plot we just made above, so nothing has really changed here. But after we've imported matplotlib, if we want to save our figure, we do need to do this plt.savefig. And then we give it a file name. And um, in this case, we could say, for instance, bar-plot.png to save a PNG file of our bar plot. And uh, if I run this with adding only that one line, this plt.savefig bar plot.png, okay, the figure still gets displayed like it did before. But if I look over here in the file browser on the left side, I can now see that I have this bar plot.png file that appeared here. You might have to refresh it if you don't see it right away. But if I double click on that, sure enough, here's the image file of the bar plot that we had previously displayed in the notebook. Here it's saved as a PNG file. If I wanted to change it to a JPEG file, I could simply just change the file extension here. 
This save fig function is kind of smart in the sense that it looks at the file extension and will save the file in the corresponding format. So if I just change PNG to JPG and run this again, uh, I can then refresh the file browser and now I can see I have a JPEG file that is the same output as what was in the PNG file. So um, I personally tend to use PNG files for raster uh, images of plots, but of course JPEG is, is equally good and sometimes necessary depending on the situation. You might have to use a JPEG for certain, uh, certain situations. I've got to wait for this. Uh, there we go. Okay, so that's how you save files basically, just the save fig um, method in the matplotlib library. There's another example here, same exact plot that we had before, but if you wanted to save it as a high resolution PDF, you could do just plt.save fig. And here we can call it uh, a different file name. So we'll call it bar plot high res. So bar plot high res dot p D -L. So that'll change obviously the output to be a PDF format, but we can also add in here DPI equals 600 to tell it to use 600 dots per inch resolution, which is a high resolution for the image that gets produced. You can basically just run the cell here. And again, if you refresh the file browser over here, you should now see this bar plot high res appeared. And if you double click on that one, it should open up in some kind of PDF viewer. And uh, if you view it at actual size, you'll see that it's nice high resolution image. Uh, you could even go to you know higher uh, zoom and see that you get indeed a much higher resolution image than what we had before. So. All we're doing here is just changing this to PDF format and then adding this DPI parameter to say it should use a high number of dots per inch or high resolution. And then finally, just a little teaser about doing interactive plotting with uh, using HVPlot. So uh, I won't go through this in detail because we need to make some time for the other parts of the lesson. But you can basically just run the cells here. And the first one with HVPlot is we're going to import the pandas submodule for HVPlot. Um, HVPlot is like a plotting API that allows us to more or less do similar things to how we plot in pandas, but um, make interactive plots in that way. This is going to plot data for the whole of month of July in 2014. And uh, the so that's what we're doing is making a data frame where we select out just the month of, of July 2014. And then instead of doing whatever that data frame is dot plot, we're doing that same thing dot HV plot. And if you run this, you'll get a plot that looks like this. You can see the kind of wiggles of the daily variations in temperature. And you can also see that as you move the mouse cursor around, whenever you're over one of the lines here, you can see the variable name, the date, and the value. So that's the temperature of that day. So if we go to, for instance, the 26th of July, let's see here. It was a warm day, as I remember. And uh, yeah, it reached a temperature of 88 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's going to be something like uh, 31 or maybe 32 degrees Celsius. So fairly warm day that day. And uh, we can see that here. What's nice about this is like, if we want to click and display or not display certain values, we can. If we want to zoom in, so we can select this zooming tool and say like, let's take a look at just a couple days of values here. We can zoom in and see in more resolution how the temperature varied throughout the days. We can reset it back to the original view. We can click and pan. And uh, it's basically allows us to interact with our data in a nice way. So depending on what you're doing, of course, this is a handy thing to, to be able to do. And uh, it's there mostly just to show you that 
with a lot of these plotting libraries, it's really as simple as just making a very small change and you can go from a static plot to something that's interactive like this. And uh, what's perhaps kind of cool about this is like it's interactive inside the Jupyter Notebook. But actually, if you go to the course webpage as well, our course webpage is produced from Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so same like what you're working with. And if you go to the course page, it's also an interactive plot in here as well. So um, it's kind of nice in the sense that like it's very easy to go from an interactive plot in a notebook to something that gets converted to a web page and uh, then anybody is able to interact with your plot data, which is kind of nice. Um, I don't know what that does. But you can also save plots from here if you'd like to. That's our basic stuff on plotting for a kind of quick introduction to how to plot with, with pandas and matplotlib. And uh, are there any questions at this point? Because if not, I think what we'll do is we can switch teachers and Kamyar will take over with the second part of the plotting lesson. And uh, I've kindly left him less time than he probably needs, but uh, hopefully we have enough time to get through that. And then we'll have a quick look at today's exercise. So we'll just switch, switch gears quickly and uh, continue in just a moment. Okay, so hi again, everyone. Uh, we are going to continue with uh, plotting. So open the other notebook file if you haven't done so already. So I have to be a little bit, well, I have to do this a little bit more quickly so we don't run out of time. But what we are going to do in the second part of today's lesson is to create some kind of like a bit more advanced plotting with pandas and matplotlib. So this is the what we are going to make in this part of lesson basically. So instead of just having one plot, we are going to create this kind of subplots, which can be useful for different kinds of cases. For example, the case, the example uh, that we will be working on is with visualizing the temperatures for different seasons of the year. So in this kind of case, it's useful to create this kind of sub subplot, which makes comparison quite easy for us. So if you just look at it, you can visually compare the plot. So th there can be examples for you where you need to kind of uh, create this kind of plots. So let's see how we can do this. So uh, as usual, we start by inputting the data, bringing data into our environment. But before that, let's import the libraries that we need. So you know this quite well by now. So we import the pandas that we will be using for manipulating, working with the data. And then we import pyplot, which you already saw today. It's a submodule under matplotlib. So if we import it like this, well, it's a bit lighter because we are not importing the whole thing. We are importing the submodule. Uh, and this way we can give it the short name plt, which makes our life a little bit easier. So let's import the libraries that we need. So next thing, so the data we are working is just the same data we have been working with. So you're familiar with how it looks. Uh, so we are going to input the data, bring the data to our environment and do some preparation, some data cleaning as usual. So this is the path to our file. We just store it in a new variable called file path. So it's a CSV file, but it is uh, separated with white spaces. This is, again, something you have seen a few times already. So what we are going to do, we provide the file path uh, to, to import the file. We set the delim white space true because that's the kind of delimiter that is used in this data. And then if you take a look at the data, uh, you will see that the, the null values, the not a number values are um, shown using different numbers of asterisks, so we put them here to so that the so that the so Python knows how the uh, null values are shown in the data. Then the columns that we are using. If you open the data, you see there's a long list of columns. We don't need all of them, so we are just going to input the timestamp, the date column, and then we have temperature and max and minimum. So we only use these columns when we are importing. 
and then we parse dates and we assign the date as the index for our data. This is again something we saw already today in the first part of the lesson and that makes plotting a little bit easier for us when we, when we are working with dates. So let's run this piece of code. So now the data should be uh, loaded to see how many numbers of rows we have in our data. Let's do this len data that we have used many times already. So as you can see, this is a this is a quite large data set. We have around 930,000 rows of data. So let's take a closer look at the data. As usual, we are going to do data.head to have to have some idea what our data looks like without opening the whole 900,000 rows. So this is how the data looks. We have three columns that we have imported. Well, of course, in addition to the index column, the dates that we have here. And you can see we have quite a bit of null values, which means that we need to do a bit of cleaning before we continue working with our data. So what we are going to do, well, the column where we have the temperature, this is what we are going to visualize. But as you can guess from the values, the temperatures are recorded in degrees Fahrenheit. But what we want to visualize is Celsius. So what we need to do is to convert this as a next step. But in order to avoid confusion with the name of the columns, one thing we do first is to rename the column that we already have. So this is now in this is called temp, but we want to rename it to temp underscore F Fahrenheit so that we don't get confused with the columns that we have when we do the conversion. And this is something you have seen already. So we create a new dictionary. The key value is the old name of the column. And then you have the new name. So if we do this, we should get the, uh, we should rename the column to make sure that this has worked properly, let's do again a data.head. See how our data looks like. So you can see that the column that we are going to work with has been successfully renamed. So now it's temp underscore F. So it's correct. So as you saw earlier, we have quite a bit of null values in our data, but let's see how many null values we have in our data set. So let's write a f string and we so number of no data values per column. Put new line. So if you do this, if you write this, uh, well, data that is nay, it's going to give. Uh, it's going to check if each value is null or not. So what it's going to return is Boolean values. So it's either true or false. But by adding this dot sum at the end, it starts to count for you for how many items in your data, for how many values your data you have uh, that is null as true. So basically, it gives you the number of null values in your data and per column. So you can see that in temperature Fahrenheit, we have around 3,500 null values. In the other two columns, the max and mean, we have a lot of null values. So we are going to only use the temperature column for visualization. So we do not bother to remove the null values from the other columns. And anyway, you can see that there are 900,000 missing values from those. So if we remove all of them from our data, we are not left with much to work with. So what we will do now is just to remove the null values from, uh, from the column that we are going to work with. 
So in order to do that, data dot drop and a so we are only going to do it for one of our columns so that's why we are specifying a subset and we provide the name of the column that we want to uh, drop the null values for which is temp underscore f Yeah, so this will drop the rows where we have null values in the column um, temperature underscore f. And here we have put set the variable, set the parameter in place as true, which, which is giving, but by default this is false. When you put it to true, it means that it is allowed to update your original data. So when you do that, you don't, the data will be updated. If you set it to false or if you leave it blank, by default it's false, which means that the data won't change, but then you can save the output into a null variable. But by doing this, data will be updated, so we don't need to do anything. So now let's check how big our data is. So we have now 928,000, which is a bit less than what we had originally because we removed the null values or we removed the rows where we had null values in column temperature underscore f. Okay, so maybe take a minute or two and try to test. This is something we are not going to continue with like dropping the values from max and min because we are not going to use those columns, but take a minute or two and try to remove the null values also from the max and mean. So let's see how many rows of data we will be left with. Okay, so I don't know if you're following at the same time. So just uh, if we remove all the rows with null values in all of the columns, we are going to lose a lot of data. So what we are going to be left with is only 20,000 rows of data. So we lose a lot of data. But in our case, well, if you have left uh, uh, in place false, like or you haven't specified this, hopefully you haven't updated the data, the original file, uh, original data we were working with. So in that case, we still get the um, with len data we get this 928,000. So this is what we are going to work with. Okay, so now what we are going to do is to convert the temperatures to Celsius from Fahrenheit, and this is something we have done many times during this course, so maybe you can type at the same time with me, because this is quite familiar for all of us. So, data, name of the field is temperature underscore F equals Yeah, so this is the equation we have seen many times to get the temperatures from Fahrenheit to Celsius and store it in a new column named temp underscore C. So we should run this now and in order to make sure that everything looks okay, let's see the data that head, what it returns to us. So we can see that everything has worked well. So we have a new column named temperature underscore C which has the new values, which are the temperatures in Celsius, degrees Celsius. Okay, so now we want to prepare, now we, uh, we did some preliminary, preliminary 
preparation without data. So we removed the null values and we converted the temperatures from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So now we want to do a bit more preparation so that we have ready data set. We have ready data for each of the seasons because as you remember, we are going to create these four subplots. Each subplot is for showing the temperatures for one of the seasons. So what we are going to do now is to prepare the data for each of the seasons. So here we already have done it for three of the seasons, so we don't have to type everything, but let's do it for, but winter is missing, so let's do it for winter together and see how this is done. So, so winter equals data.log, again, something you are familiar with from before. So if you remember as index, we have, a, we have a specified the date as index. So what we are going to do now is to get all the dates that are between uh, 2012, 1st of December 2012. So we are going to write that. So it will be 2012, 12-1, midnight. And so all the way to the beginning of uh, March. So from 1st of December to begin 1st of March. So it will be in the following year, 2013, 03, which is March then 1st of March, and then it will be midnight. Then we store the, the field that we are going to work with for the visualization is just the temperatures in Celsius. So to make our life easier, we are going to store it into a new variable called temperature or uh, winter underscore temps. So it will be easier to use it later. So it will be just winter Okay, so now we have it for all this uh, season. So for uh, for winter, we have from December to end of February or 1st of March. And for, for spring, we have March to May. And for summer, we have from June to August. And for autumn, we have from September to November. So the rest of them are already typed in. So if we just run the cell, everything should, uh, uh, should should go forward. So let's now create a plot. So we have already practiced today that we can, how we can uh, create plots. So before we try to create the subplots, let's just make individual plots to see how things look like. So let's call, let's try it with winter first. We call it X1 and the column, that we, have, uh, we have saved the column that we want to visualize into a variable na named winter underscore temps already. So that's a little bit easier. And then we use dot plot. So this should give us a plot of the temperature winters, uh, winter temperatures. So yeah, so if you do the same thing for all of them, you can get the plot. So this second one is for spring, spring underscore temps dot plot. And, and then we have it for summer and for winter. So, so there are a number of problems with this. Well, one thing is that some details are missing from the figure that we will try to update. Another thing, a motivation behind creating this subplot is that it's a bit hard to compare them because they're in different figures. And another thing is that, of course, the temperature ranges are different in all the season. 
season. So the, this y-axis has different ranges. So for example, in case of spring, we have temperatures ranging from something around minus 20 to all the way to 20. So it makes it a little bit uh, difficult to compare the charts just visually without like looking at the numbers. So this is also something we are going to try to fix. So we are going to update the, the, uh, the range of the values we have on our y-axis. So in order to do that, we are going to get, well, we want to have it wide enough that it includes all the values we have, all the temperatures we have. And to make it look a bit nicer, we don't want it to start, like we don't want to have a data point which is right on the edge of the figure. So we find the minimum value and then we subtract it with five. So it's like minimum value minus five. And we do a similar thing with the maximum value. So we find the maximum value, maximum temperature in our data, then plus five it gives us a bit of like margin so it looks a little bit nicer on the map so we already have it for maximum temperatures but let's see how we can do it for the minimum so what we want to do first is to find the minimum temperature So probably, well, uh, probably the coldest temperature is in uh, winter or spring. But just to be sure, we are going to test, like, check all the data we have to make to find to make sure that we find the minimum temperature. So let's do it for all of the season. Winter underline temps. Dot me. Then we have spring underline temps dot mean then we have summer underscore temps dot mean then we have autumn temps Okay, so what we are doing here is we are finding, well, each of our variables are basically a series. So a panda series. So we are finding the minimum temperature for each of the seasons. And then we will end up with four values here. For each season, we have the minimum value. And then with this other mean, we are getting the minimum value of these four values. So it will leave us with the, the lowest value, the, the minimum temperature I mean, we have in all our data across all seasons. So as I said, to make sure that it looks a bit nicer on the map, we are going to, so we store the value min temp, and then we update the value by subtracting five. So it will be min temp minus five. So we are doing the same thing here. So we are finding the max values in each of the seasons, and then we will end up with four values, maximums for each of the seasons, and from the four with this other max uh, function, we are going to get the, uh, the, the maximum value. So we end up with the minimum and maximum 35 minus and plus 35, which we are going to use in our plot. So now we want to create our first set of subplots. The data is ready, so now we can get it started with creating our subplot. So this is how we do it. So what we are doing, uh, so we are setting two variables. So what this function is returning us is basically two values that we will look at a bit later. So let's first type the code, plt.subplots. The number of rows in rows equals two. Number of columns. So this is you're specifying how many plots you basically want, how many rows and columns of plots you want. Number of columns equals two. And then pick size if equals same as what we had before, 12 and 8 inches.
Yeah. So, uh, so you get two variables. You're storing two values in two separate uh, variables. The fig is the overall image you are producing here, including all the subplots. And then you have this axis, which give you access to each of the subplots you are creating. And this gives you the, the fig size, gives you the overall size of the figure you are creating. So this number of rows and number of columns specify how many subplots you want. So for example, if you have uh, three columns of, uh, if you provide three, it's going to give you three subplots in each of the rows. But in this case, we have four seasons, so we go with like two by two, which gives us four uh, subplots, for one for each of the seasons. So what you can see is that uh, the axis is, and well, here we have two nested lists, so it's, we have two lists under a list. So the way to access this is that, okay, the one that we have on top left in the list one, the first list has the rows. So you have the subplots in the first list. So the way to access this first one is from the index zero of the first list and the index zero of the second list. So if you look at here, you have these nested lists. So this is zero, zero, this is zero, one. This is one zero and one one. So to make it a little bit easier and a bit more intuitive, we are going to store this in new variables and we call them x one one, x one two, two one and two two. So we don't have to use this in the indices all the time. So let's run this. Now using these variables, we can access each of these uh, subplots in our work. Okay, so now that we have created these subplots, we are going to load our values to the chart and create the visualization. So we already have the code here written for three seasons. Let's do it together for winter. So line width is 1.5 because we are going to use it in every season, the same value. So we don't want to type it every time. For so we just stored it in a variable. But let's see how this works. So winter underscore temps this is what we want to visualize dot plot then x equals x1 so we are going to put it in the first the top left uh, subplot which we had named x11 if you remember x11 so this is specifies the location and then with color, something that you have seen already today, we are saying we are choosing blue for season winter. Uh, so we just write blue. There is a link with a list of colors that are already available to you. You can check that later if you want. And then for line width, we have already stored it in a variable up here. So we just, we don't type the value, we just put the name of the variable, which was line width. Then another thing is that, uh, well, we often, we wanted to have the same uh, range for the y-axis in all, all of them. And you remember, we, we identified the minimum and maximum temperatures. So we specify the, uh, the y-limit. So it will be from the mean temp we calculated earlier all the way to the max temp that we calculated earlier. Okay, so now we have it for all the seasons. So the Y limit is set. We have the line width, the colors are different and we have specified that each of them is located in uh, the right place. So and X 11, 12, 2, 1 and 2, 2. So if now we run this code, okay, we have some problem here. Oh, we didn't close this, of course. Yeah. So now that you do this, you should see that the, the data is visualized in all of the subplots. So this already looks quite good. We have progressed a lot with creating these subplots. 
There are still a few things that we can improve. For example, you can see the labels we have on the y-axis are overlapping with, uh, with the lower subplots. So this is something we want to fix. And if you remember the figure I showed you at the beginning, we want to also add grids to make the chart a bit more readable and some add some title. So let's add, continue and add a little bit more detail to our chart. So let's create the subplots again. So it's basically the same code we had earlier. Let's just run it again. So now we are going to add a few details to our, so this is basically the same. We just set the parameter grid equal true. So it's going to create a grid uh, for each of the subplots. The rest is the same we had. Another thing you can add to your chart is this subtitle. This is short for a super title. So it creates a, uh, a title for the figure. So if you want to, so this will be one big title for the whole figure. If you want to add, we are not going to do this here, but if you want to add the small titles for each of the subplots, you can write something like x dot set underscore title. And then you just put some uh, title for it. So it's for each of the subplots. But here we just put one uh, super title for the whole thing. And um, yeah, so what we are going to do, if you remember, we had this uh, overlap between this. Uh, this was overlapping with this lower subplot. So in order to avoid that, we are going to rotate the values a little bit. In order to do that, we can just write uh, we can set the properties, so it's plt.set properties, and then we access each of the axes we have here, and uh, we are rotating the major tick labels for 20 degrees. So it's basically by trial and error how it works. 20 degrees seems to work with this one. So yeah, so the rest is the same. And another thing, we are going to add some text to the plots and. Uh, this is something we saw earlier today. So you specify where on your chart you want to have the uh, text. So it, we put the text at around this. So this is like X and Y. So this is the time. And this is at minus 25 degrees. So we place the text winter, spring, summer, and autumn in that location on our chart. So yeah, so this is where the text appeared. So around minus 25 degrees and around this time of year. So those are the coordinates. So now our chart looks a lot better. Yeah, so now we are short on time, but something you can try later is to try to visualize only two of the seasons. So we have done it for four seasons, so it should be easy to do it for so two seasons only. We just change the number of subplots we want to create, but that should be straightforward. Yeah, so another extra thing to look at uh, is the use of styles. When you're working with uh, plots, you can apply a style. So if you write plt.style.use, then that style will be applied to whatever plot you create after that. So there is a link later after this box here. So if you go to that link, you see a bunch of different kinds of styles you can just use. So if you, so here we have an example of using PL, uh, dark background. So now if we recreate, so the code is basically the same thing. We just, before that we applied this style. And now if we recreate our chart, it's going to look slightly different. So it's it has this dark background. So if you just check this website, there are different styles. So if you can just easily use them to update the style of your uh, charts. And if you want to get back to what you had, you can just remove that line of code or set this style to default. So if you just type in default here, it's going to be the default style of the library. Yeah. So that was it. Do you have any questions from this part of the lesson?
If not, I will just quickly show you the exercise and then we can briefly talk about also the final assignment. So, so the exercise 7 is uh, quite uh, simple for the reason that you will also at the same time start working on your final assignment of the course. So the exercise is a bit less demanding and you do not have any optional exercise this time. So it's just two problems that you will be solving. In the first problem, you will create a scatter plot of random points. So you, you are going to create this kind of a scatter plot. So the, the, you, you don't have a data you work with. You just create a random data set in the first step. And you so you generate random values and you assign random colors. And then you create this kind of visualization with the things we have practiced so far. This should be quite straightforward. In the second problem, you're going to work again with temperatures. So we are going to work with another data set, temperatures from Helsinki, Vanta. And then we have a number of columns. And what you're going to do is just visualize the temperatures in Celsius. So this is something that we, we, we did something very similar to this already today. So it should be quite straightforward. Okay, yeah, so just very quickly about the final exercise. Uh, I think last time when we were here, we already kind of saw the basic structure for the exercise and things. Um, it should now be the case that the GitHub Classroom link is working there, so you can create your copy of the final assignment. Um, but we can also have a look at it on, uh, on GitHub, for example. And uh, I think the things to point out here that have changed since last week, I think we mentioned that there would be some additional information about the possible use of AI tools like ChatGPT. So now you will see there's a statement here that says it's fine if you want to use something like ChatGPT to work on this exercise, you are allowed to do so. And uh, there are some additional details about the ways in which you can use ChatGPT that are given down below here. Uh, so if you scroll down, all of this stuff should be the same as it was last week, but this has now been updated here for this use of AI uh, tools in this exercise, etc. <clears throat> so the things I'd like to point out here is, first off, if you choose to use something like ChatGPT, you should add a section to your notebook called Acknowledgements, where you state uh, that you have used whatever the, the tool is that you've used, whether it's ChatGPT or some other kind of similar tool um, you should acknowledge that in a section called Acknowledgements somewhere, probably toward the end of your uh, your notebook. So make a markdown cell and put a heading called Acknowledgements there and make it clear what you have used. In addition, uh, we would ask that you have a second section included in the notebook called Use of AI Tools, where you describe in enough detail that uh, we could basically reproduce what you've done how it is that you've used whatever tool you've chosen to use, again, if you choose to use something like ChatGPT. So you need to explain uh, how it's been used in general terms, like if you use the tool to produce some of the text in your exercise, that needs to be stated clearly, or if you used it to produce code, that should be clear as well. And if you've used it for code, we would ask that you list all of the prompts that you typed into, for instance, ChatGPT to produce the code that was produced um, or generated. And uh, we would also ask that you then show what the final version of the code is that was produced from the AI tool. And uh, if you've modified it, which presumably you would, you should also then say how you have modified the code that was produced. Uh, these things are just sort of statistical models in terms of producing the code, so there's no guarantee if we copy-pasted the prompts in that we would get exactly the same things you produce, but we should be able to see a clear connection between the code you have and the prompts that you might have used if you choose to use something like uh, ChatGPT. Just to be clear, we also state here that if you do use these kind of tools without saying anything about it, of course, that's considered uh, to be similar to cheating, so you should be clear about how and which tools you've used. I think, in fact, they even ask here maybe that you would list what version of things that you're using. Um, so if you're using, yeah, you know, JetGPT Plus with uh, GPT 4.0 or something else, 
um, you should do that. And also be aware that although you might get code produced by things like ChatGPT that you might use in the exercise or, or use as the basis for what you do in the exercise, you should also be aware that you're responsible for whatever the code is that gets produced there. And that means that you should also pay attention to the things uh, that are listed up here. Like if you're asked to include comments in the code, you should make sure that you do that and you should recognize that what's listed here, these are the instructions for what to do in the exercise in your code, uh, whether it's produced by you or produced by some kind of AI tool that you've then modified. Um, it still needs to do the same thing for uh, what gets produced in the end from the exercise. So, yeah, I think I just wanted to kind of highlight that this description of the sort of conditions under which you can use these kind of tools is now more clear here. And also, you'll find if you look at the grading um, criteria, which are also on the course webpage, you'll see now that there is a statement up here at the top that says uh, that it's okay to use this for the final exercise, but you have to follow the course guidelines as well as the instructions for the AI use um, in, in the final exercise description. So there's nothing that's explicitly linked in the uh, grading criteria here to whether or not you use these tools. But of course, um, again, if you're using something like ChatGPT without saying anything about it, that is uh, going to be a bit of a problem. So are there any questions about this or the final exercise in general? We, we went through this last week, right? Like it, the kind of overview or did we, I can't remember whether we, yeah. Does everybody kind of remember the general idea? So basically it's like uh, we're gonna do this kind of temperature anomaly calculation similar to what you did in exercise number six, but um, but we don't provide the notebook. It's just an empty notebook for you. So there's no structure to it. And you're asked to go through and basically uh, for, I think it's the data from the Sodankula station, calculate what the uh, temperature anomalies would be for different seasons of the year from 1909 until the end of the data set, uh, which I think is in 2019 or 2020, something like that. And then you'll make a plot, kind of like what we did in the last part of what uh, Kamyar was just showing with these subplots. So if you have any questions, feel free to let us know by coming down now or asking a question in Discord or whatever. Uh, otherwise, exercise number seven is due a week from Friday. This final exercise is due in a few weeks from now. So I think it's on the 15th of November is the due date. So a little ways off there. And... Um, the exercise help sessions will still still happen as usual this week on Thursday and Friday, but after that, uh, you'll have to go to Discord or contact us for additional additional help. I think that's maybe everything. So, yeah, we hope you enjoyed the course and uh, good luck with the exercise this week and with the final exercise.